My name is Sinead McBrarty and I am the Chief Executive of Education Support uh, and Education Support is the charity for everybody working in education. We exist to improve the mental health and well-being of the workforce uh, and we do that in a number of ways. We provide support for individuals, we provide resources, information, we have a free counselling helpline, an 08000 number that colleagues will share through the webinar. We also provide financial assistance for people who are struggling, helping them to stay in work. Uh, we work directly with schools. We provide supervision to school leaders. Uh, we're an EAP provider, employee assistance program provider, and we're very proud of the high quality of service we deliver to schools through that. Uh, we also research the health and well-being of the sector of the workforce and use the insight and findings from that research to lobby for change, to try and make improvement. Uh, and and uh, we talk to policymakers about what are the causes of stress and pressure and what can we do differently uh, for the profession. So again, if you have burning thoughts that you feel nobody understands uh, and you think we should be thinking about, or if there are topics and questions that you think really need to have a good airing through a webinar or a conversation, please do add it to the chat and the conversation and we'll take that away and think about it. Uh, but to today's uh, event, I'm so pleased to welcome Amy Scott to join us uh, for this webinar. We are talking about um, switching off in the summer. We're talking about resting and recharging. Amy is a BACP accredited counsellor. She worked as a primary school teacher, so she knows the ins and outs of it. And she still uh, works part time in a, an inner city primary school, supporting pupils and their families. Um, she, but she also has a private counseling uh, and coaching practice. And, and in that, she's working with grown ups. Um, but she brings that experience of both counseling and primary settings to this conversation. So we know it's going to be some really rich and useful insight from Amy today. Welcome, Amy. Um, I also want to welcome Nick Bailey. Nick is a middle leader, uh, business and economics, I believe, Nick is, is well remembered. That's it. That's your your space. Um, and I know that you are particularly uh, interested in employability skills and in supporting your learners uh, to really develop in that way and making sure that we have a good broad curricula uh, around that. Um, I know you've also been working on workload management strategies and trying to really think about some of these issues in practice. What do we do to make people's lives better around workload and, and how do we prioritize work-life balance uh, or what does that mean in, inside a department uh, in, a, in, a, in a secondary school. So really pleased to have you here to bring that perspective, Nick. Thanks for joining us. And I'm also really delighted to introduce Sarah Brown to you. Sarah is an early years teacher um, and she also has spent her career in inner city schools, uh, in, in less well-resourced areas. Um, she's done a lot of work as a mentor for early career teachers, helping to uh, helping new teachers to come in and find which way is up, which is always rather useful, I think. Um, uh, and Sarah also speaks with passion and authenticity about her experience as a teacher with dyslexia, uh, role modeling really nicely um, how a learning disability doesn't have to be anything that gets in the way of, of teaching. So we're really pleased to have Sarah here with us today as well. So as ever, for those of you who are new to this, the general format of these conversations is we try and look at a few themes. Uh, we are very focused on what can we what can we provide you in terms of tips? And so I'll be asking all of my panelists here today to offer us some thoughts and tips about practically what can people do in these different areas. Um, so let's kick off. Um, I am going to begin with Nick. Nick, tell me this. We're talking about summer. We're talking about uh, making a shift. We are going to come and talk about actually the, the real um, nitty gritty around rest. But how do you transition? How do you go from running around like a headless chicken with your business and economics portfolio there and hit the summer and find a way to not do you do you collapse what do you do how do you make that work oh thanks um so just a level with everyone um this isn't my opinion this is, i've actually surveyed our staff to get a whole host of feedback so please don't think this is uh all my opinion i'm basing it somewhat on on statistics data and uh 
qualitative research. But I think for me, um, it's really important that we we almost have this kind of transition period. Um, so quite a lot of staff um, who I spoke to said they almost set up um, a somewhat significant activity in that first week. Um, so whether it is a day out, whether it's going out for dinner, they do some things to kind of set up that barrier of, OK, I'm now holiday me. Um, and I think I, I talk about identity quite a lot with people like, you know, we, we spend our lives having to be Mr. Bailey or Mrs. Scott or Mrs. Brown or whatever. And I think it's quite hard to then almost click your fingers and go, right now I'm back to being an adult. And I think having that almost instant activity um, just to kind of kickstart your brain a little bit psychologically, um, I think is really important. Um, and I know our school has shared that as a strategy for a number of years. Um, in fact, we 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 load up twilights to finish a little bit earlier. Um, so conveniently for me, I finish on the Tuesday. My own children don't finish till the Thursday and my wife doesn't finish till the Friday. So I've got those couple of days to kind of uh, uh, transform a little bit and become me, um, have a day of just potentially doing nothing, seeing my friends, whatever, um, just to hopefully kind of label it as officially holiday time. I love that. I love the focus on identity and and putting down Mr. Rayleigh and picking up Nick. I think that um, is a, a, a really helpful way about of thinking about that shift. Um, Sarah, let me ask you just just quickly, how is it for you that transition into the summer? I always really struggle um, because it takes me a good two or three weeks to kind of wind down so kind of the one week half terms aren't enough so getting into the summer kind of I always spend the first week or so kind of in school mode getting up at six o'clock and thinking oh I don't actually have to be up and I don't need to be running around and doing all my jobs so it's kind of it takes a while and then eventually my body gets used to it and I can wake up at half seven eight I can go to the gym and things and like Nick said it it's very much about finding things to do that are pleasurable and things you want to do um and I often end up going into school and finding tasks to do or recessing my classroom or putting things away and spending a chunk of time doing what I need to get done and then try and use the rest of the time for things that I'm going to enjoy and spending time with family and friends um, and like setting realistic expectations for myself because often we can put in things that you know are unrealistic and I remember spending the first couple of years of my teaching career thinking I need to get all this done in the holidays and then I can do all this fun stuff and it never got done and that bag of books just sat at home um or the bag of cutting and laminating sat at home um and it it's just not great and it makes you feel rubbish so I definitely you know think about your holidays and if you need to plan them out it's not a bad thing um you know and get those summer holiday plans booked in um because it is is really useful for for your mental health to kind of chunk it out if you need to um to get that, it in that metaphor of the bag of cutting and laminating sitting in the hallway this i feel this myself i can really relate to it um amy thinking about rest rest and recovery this is all a bit overplayed is this not all just a little bit woke generation I mean don't can't we just can't we just suck it up and get on with it why does this stuff matter yeah I find it with that simple I mean we we can suck it up and get on with it and then we will burn out and we will be ill there's a great saying that if we don't take the time to rest our body will find it for us and we'll get ill or you know we'll get really anxious or we'll get depressed and we'll find it really difficult to function until our autonomic nervous system says you've got to, you've got to rest. So it is really important to timetable it in. Um, you know, we've got this stiff upper lip kind of thing in Britain, which doesn't serve us very well. You know, it's a human necessity to rest. It's programmed into us. It's really a non-negotiable. Um, otherwise, we just don't do very well. The idea of it being a necessity is quite a different framing, isn't it? Because I think oftentimes we think of holidays as sort of a nice extra. Um, and there's obviously a lot of mythology about school holidays and what that actually means. Um, what happens, Amy, when we rest? What's going on inside our systems? You talked about the autonomic nervous system. Mm. There. What's happening when we rest? What, what actually is going on? 
Yeah, try and summarize it because that's a massive question. We could probably do a three hour, <laughs> three hour webinar just on that. Um, there's this great theory called polyvagal theory, which I am very much into, and it's all about the link between our bodies and our minds and our emotions. It's not one or the other. So just as stress isn't just an emotional mental thing, rest isn't just an emotional mental thing. So we've got to simplify it, we've got three different states. You've got your calm kind of rest and digest. I'm not going to use scientific terms, but your rest and digest state. Then you've got your fight flight state. Then you've got freeze or collapse, which is at the bottom. Um, often with school staff, we get to that collapse state when we meet the summer because we've been running around in fight flight, you know, with all that adrenaline. And I definitely used to get ill in the first week of summer in, in every teaching role I had, you know, support staff teaching, um, because I I just stopped. And now like our other two speakers, I timetable some time in to make sure that it's a gradual resting response. So ideally what happens when we rest is we get to that rest and digest that kind of, it's called ventral vagal, which is that connection um, with ourselves, with each other, you know, the adrenaline decreases, the cortisol decreases, which has just a plethora of effects on our bodies. So when we're stressed, we often get upset stomachs, we get muscle tension, hopefully that kind of disappears. But what sometimes happens is we go into that shutdown state when we're trying to rest. So it's not really a one-stop shot. We've got to look after ourselves physically as well as emotionally and be aware of what's going on for us, especially if we've had a really, really, really stressful um, term, which I would imagine most of us have a stressful couple of years, to be honest, rather than a stressful term. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah, thinking about what Amy's just said there in terms of what all of this means and, and the fact that it's not just one thing, there are different ways that we have to think about our recovery, if you like, from, from a, a very stressful term. I know that you've talked about timetabling self-care making sure that you you build time in what does that look like so for you in practice what might how might you approach that how might you do that um so for me I guess it's making kind of blocking out time where I have to do things so um planning out the coffee dates with friends or making time that's um intentional to go to the park for a walk or making time to go to the gym and kind of putting it in the calendar on my phone as a reminder or making like you know plans with friends that are non-negotiable so like if I'm going to be at work in my classroom setting up until kind of 2 30 and meeting a friend at three o'clock um it's like I'm meeting a friend at three o'clock and it's I'm not going to change it it's I'm meeting them at a coffee shop at three o'clock I have to leave at 2 30 um it's that's it's it's kind of those boundaries um and I think it's it's that word boundaries that gets very hard to put in place as a teacher because we set boundaries for children and we know that they're there to keep the children safe but often we can really struggle to put them in place for ourselves as teachers because we push them so much ourselves because we we know that there's an endless to-do list of things that we have to do and we need to get done and we just don't have the time to do it um so I think it's been really intentional and not setting yourself too many things to do as well I think that's really important and as you were saying about rest and as Amy was saying about rest you know rest is so important if it could just be you going to school for an hour to set up your classroom or mark two books and then you spend the rest of the day chilling on the couch at home and that that is rest and that is so important for your body um and you shouldn't be made to feel bad about that that's so important and integral for your body that's what it needs um and I think that even mapping that out for a day it's not a bad thing it's it's quite a good thing um lovely thank you and and Nick I know you're going to have something to say on switching off and and how how do you think about it when you've spoken to colleagues with your um uh your research approach to this webinar preparation which I'm very grateful for um how do you how do others think about switching off and, and what practically are people doing because this is a this is the real nub of part of this isn't it is making that that transition and actually switching off what have you learned yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, 
a lot of people mentioned exercise so I was, I was just writing a message to everyone sorry that I've realized I only sent to us but um I think exercise is really important I think um I was just replying to a question from Philip um and he was saying about routine and I think look, humans like routines as teachers we're kind of program for it with our you know lesson to lesson we, we, my school even still has a bell so you know you can't even pick when the lesson ends because the bell was going and the kids start packing away and I think we we may need to recreate that in our own lives so uh, a number of of colleagues said they still actually wake up at the same time they don't have a lay-in like Sarah mentioned um you know they still drag themselves out of bed at seven o'clock and instead they just go to the gym for eight o'clock now that might work for some people um for others and and again this is thinking generally um is a physical barrier um so my kind of uh red line for no better phrase is physical stuff being at home um so whatever happens in my life come what may i will not take my physical work into my house now you know that might not be possible for everyone i appreciate if you're marking something practical that might be challenging but i think look we've got to fight back against the kind of relentless do more do more do more and if i can just hold that line um i feel like I, I, i'm creating that 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 protection for myself almost um my second one um really thinking from a leadership point of view um so about four or five years ago my my head department at the time uh, mentioned this idea of what he called workload neutral um which was relatively new at the time really and it was this idea of every time you add something new that you'd like to do you you try and replace it by taking away something else um and that's something we've tried to do for a number of years now look is it perfect all the time absolutely not but i think as from a mental you know i'm, I'm going a bit uh, ect mentoring here but you know in terms of our, managing our mental load i think it's very important that if you're going to add something new that i've got to think about doing well what can i take away um and i think almost from a from a buy-in point of view from staff as well I think you're going to get far more purchase in in that respect if you're seen to be doing something active I think I imagine we've got a, a number of leaders in in certain ways in here and I think the, the key message really um from my very limited research and um, far below what education and sport are doing is that staff will do stuff if they feel like it either is worth their time or if they feel like something else is being forgiven so staff will go above and beyond as and when needed. But if they're going to do that, they would like to get something back. Yeah. Yeah. Really helpful. Thank you, Nick. Um, Amy, part of what comes up there with both Nick and Sarah's comments, it seems to me, sits around boundaries. And we talk about boundaries a lot. And I think there's a lot of I think for some people, boundaries, they absolutely understand what that means. For others, they're not quite sure what it means and what good boundaries looks like versus, you know, an inability to hold a boundary. Mm. Do you ever say anything about that? And also about maybe what helps people to set some boundaries, how that how they might yeah. think about that? The boundaries are tricky, but they're so important. And, you know, there's lots of different types of boundaries. There's boundaries with our time. There's boundaries with others. And there's boundaries with ourselves. So... Again, a big topic, but um, to try and summarize, again, I would take it back to that mind-body link. Often when we don't put a boundary in, it's because we've reacted rather than taking the time to pause and respond. That's normally from a little bit of fight flight. So if you're heading towards the summer and someone's asking you, actually, you need to do all of this work during the summer. I know it can be really, really difficult to speak to management, depending on you know, lots of factors, what schools are in, what the relationships are like. But I tend to take a breath, ground myself and just I have a set like list of things that I might say if I need more time so I might say do you know what um, I'm just going to think about that and I'm going to come back to you or I'm not sure I've got capacity I'm just going to check um, I might say I took this to my partner who works in a different field but you know actually yeah I'd love to do that but I'm going to have to drop something if I do that so can we have a conversation around that I know in some schools that's easier than in others um, and it can be terrifying. So having that self-compassion to notice your heart beating really fast, to notice that it's really difficult for you, um, to give yourself that space is really, really important. You've got a right to have a think about things. You've got a right to stick up your boundaries. One of my heroes, I don't think she even knows she's one of my teaching heroes, was a colleague I used to have who just used to go, no. <laughs> and she, 
Yeah, she was so brave. Like someone would email her about the summer and they'd say, oh, we, want, we need your classroom 100% set up. And she'd be like, no, we, this is our holidays. Other people take their holidays when they want to. Um, I didn't even realize it was an option until I heard her say it. And I was thinking, oh, the world is going to implode. Like it's all going to go wrong for her. And it, it didn't. So I kind of try and channel her. And then boundaries with ourselves, we often think of teachers and education staff, you know, if we don't work ourselves into the ground, then it's all going to fall apart for the children. But the reality is we role model for the children. They're picking up on everything that we do. They're very clever. They're very tuned in. Um, and if we are not setting boundaries and we are exhausted and we are snappy, that is what we're teaching them for their working lives. And that's what we're teaching them for their relationship. So it's really important. And then time, I'm awful. I'm awful at time boundaries. Like I'll be the first one to say, it. I'm not naturally good at this stuff. So I have to literally set timers for things. If I'm working on a task and I'm setting myself an hour, I will set myself a timer for an hour and then I will stop. Um, I have, it's a bit embarrassing admitting this, but I bought myself, I heard it on a podcast, a lockable box for my phone. I've tried the app, like override the app. They're, they're addictive. They're made to be addictive. I thought this is ridiculous buying this. It's the best, they're not, it wasn't particularly cheap, but it's the best money I've ever spent because I cannot get into that box. I didn't realize how addicted I was. And I'm always like, I have no time. I have time. Uh, I'm just far too tuned into this addictive technology. So there's an amazing saying by a lady called Kristen Neff, and she's written a book on it. It's called Fear Self Compassion. Self compassion isn't just bubble bath. It isn't just, I mean, they're great. Don't get me wrong, they have their place. But it's about sticking up for ourselves the same way we stick up for the people in our care and being fierce, you know, and protecting ourselves as much as we protect others. Because we do, we do a really good job of protecting others. And we've got to look out for number one as well. It's, it's actually when you sit with that, it's quite powerful, isn't it? The mm. whole idea that we have to actually work and be a bit fierce on our own account. Sarah, how much is that contrary to the mindset of teachers? I really, I'm not asking you to represent the whole the whole profession, by the way, but, but your perspective on that question. Um, very interesting you ask. Um, I think it's really contrary, um, to be honest, especially for me, um, when I was a NQT, well, ECT now, as they're called. Um, and I think it, it resonates a lot with um, early career teachers and um, teachers going into leadership, because especially in primary and early years, you kind of are in the mindset of, I have to do, 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 do. And I'm constantly plowing on because I have to I have to I have to and like Nick said you know we need to start kind of standing up and saying actually no we can't do this and like Amy said you know we need to be kind of having those conversations of well I can do that but something's going to have to give or you know okay I can pick up that extra class but that means that something's going to have to give on my timetable because I can't be doing all this and that I you know that means I'm going to be doing extra but at the same time that's really difficult for somebody to have that conversation when SLT have got the expectation of you um and especially when we've been in a mindset of we can just keep doing and doing and doing and people can just keep giving us more and more and more I think it's going to take a lot of mindset changes in a lot of settings for that to come into play um but I completely agree with Amy in the fact that you know, there are smarter and better ways of working, but we do also need to look after ourselves. And number one is so important. And we advocate for our families and our children so much. And we look after them so well. And like, we can't do that unless we're the best, like the best of ourselves. And we really need to do that for ourselves. And there does need to be massive changes and a shift in education and across the wider sector. But until that happens, you know, we are just, you know, filling the gaps for ourselves and doing what we can to help and support us. Um, you know, but I think boundaries is is a really good place to start. And, you know, the more of us that are having those conversations and just saying, actually, do you know what? Like, I'll happily do that, but we need to we need to have a conversation about this. Or, you know, yes, I can cover classes, but that means that this is going to have to give because you're taking away two hours of my PPA time or this. Is, is not feasible I think those are really good places to start um so yeah. 
Lovely. And, and I think part of the original purpose of this webinar series and, and you all who are, are listening in are the folks who can tell us whether it, it, it's working or not working. But part of our original thinking was it wouldn't it be lovely if there was a place where people could come and feel some sense of community and take courage from hearing what others are doing so that they don't feel like they're the only one who's trying to hold up the roof or, or stop the avalanche of overwork. Um, and so, so hearing those perspectives is really important. Um, and on that, Nick, actually, there's a, there's a remark in the chat you'll have seen in there about what, how do you, you know, in your setting or with colleagues you've spoken to, what's your view on, on results day and the analysis and the demand and the presence that's required in the summer when you're trying to be unwound and staying in some kind of, you know, Re replenishing yourself how do you engage with that how do you think about it so <clears throat> some people would disagree um I, I, my honest opinion is that results day is, is an important day but yeah fundamentally the work is done that gets those results um i, I personally uh, haven't actually been to my gc results day for the last four years because i've been on holiday um and when i look back on it i think you know what did I was I really that much more proficient at my job in September, having attended the A level results day compared to the GCSE? You know, and it just goes back to this question again of, am I just doing something because it's the way it's always been done? Am I just doing something because of, uh, uh, what's the phrase? An unsupported, not evidence based theory that this is an important thing that has to be done, or am I better off? Quick glance to results. Okay. I'll, I'll venture that in September. Yeah, and I've, I think, look, it's very difficult because look, we're held by performance measures. Individuals might be held by pay progression on performance measures. So I'm not going to say that I don't care about results. Obviously, we want the best outcomes for our students. But it is me doing two to three days and disrupting my August for two weeks in a row overall going to be healthy am i going to add enough value to my practice that it's worth disrupting my holiday and i appreciate it's very easy to say you know and particularly if you're a head teacher and you're pushing for outstanding and all that stuff i, I totally get that point of view but i think you've just you've, you've just got to look at every activity you're doing particularly around particularly around results because fundamentally the build up to the exam you can still have an impact but those results are done yeah you know, I'm I'm marking A level papers right now, and there's nothing those teachers can do. They can go, they can yeah, they can turn up on that results stand, all the data analysis they want, but beyond the odd remark that might gain two marks or whatever, it's done. It's it's in the water. And if we're going to measure everything in in utility, to use an economics term, if it's disrupting my holiday, it's got to add a heck of a lot of utility for me to see it's worth doing. You, you know, you you've got to be looking at bumping me up 10% on in terms of ADC, in terms of nine to fours or something like that. Because my holiday is my time and, and it, I'm not going to come back from holiday to a results day unless I really, really, really felt like there was something absolutely unique and unbelievable that I'm going to find out. And, and you're right, there might be a leadership role, which means that that is definitely something you have to have in the mix or you need to somehow cover it between you and other colleagues. But I guess there's also a bit about, it seems to me in what you're, you're saying, there's a little bit about being finding a way to experiment with doing it differently I guess when you know if you haven't been for four years I guess at some point you decided to take a leap and not go and then discover that you know the sky didn't fall down or you were able to still turn up in September and do enough and whatever but I guess there's a little bit about finding maybe not needing to make a decision for the rest of your career as much as maybe I'll try and do it differently this year yeah, and I think look, we, we we've got to be reflective about everything we do. Um, I'll give you another one, one, albeit not necessarily about summer switch off, but we didn't run any scheduled intervention sessions this year, or yeah. tutorial sessions, whatever the new term is. And you think, well, are we gambling with our results here? You know, what's going to happen? Well, fundamentally, if we don't draw the line somewhere, we're never going to. If we just keep rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeating. Yeah. We're all going to be stressed out. We're all going to have people leaving the profession. Uh, and fundamentally, I'd rather have someone happy in the room. I actually completely, um, not necessarily linked to this webinar, but I actually do the odd student survey myself just among my ECTs and, and my department. And the overwhelming message that comes out from students is, 
X is grumpy <laughs> or I don't like X's lessons because, you know, they don't seem to care or they're bored or whatever. A, that's sad to hear. And B, it's probably because that person's overworked. It's probably because that person's stressed out. So going back to what Amy said about looking after ourselves, you know, these little things that, that might seem quite minute, you know, not going to results day or whatever. But if that adds to our happiness, not only does it keep us in the profession, but it probably makes us better practitioners. Because we turn up in September, which is a horrible time of year, by the way, <laughs> and we actually deliver strong lessons from day one. Rather than turning up in September, already burnt out, and a bunch of new classes go, who's this Muppet? Why have I been stuck with him? Or Love it. Love it. Uh, I can hear my son's voice in your in your descriptions and <laughs> moments there, Nick. Um, Amy, if if we've got we've got a comment in the chat, you know, people who, ha who have over the course of the summer got admin work that they have to get done. And I'm still holding Sarah's metaphor. I'm taking it as a metaphor, Sarah. I know it's real for you of the bag of cutting and laminating in the hall or the bag of books or whatever it is. When people are facing into the summer and they know there's stuff they have to get done, should they be trying to do it at the beginning of the summer and then rest? Should they be leaving it until they're recovered and then approaching it and coming back early? Um, you know, what's the magic answer, Amy? Yeah, I wish I had one. Uh, the magic answer is get to know yourself. And that's really hard, right? Because we're used to working for other people and not focusing on ourselves. And the first thing I learned when I stopped working in schools and trying to be a counsellor was I had to really get to know myself. And that was actually transformational. And it makes me better in my school job now. So know yourself. If you're somebody who is going to get stressed in the final week, whatever. So if you're somebody like me who gets that sense of dread and like, oh my God, I can't relax. I'm, I'm like, I might as well do it in the yeah, final week because I've experimented. I've tried doing it in the first week and it doesn't make any difference. I just then keep working and keep working and keep working. And then I'm like, oh, well, I haven't had a summer. So for me personally, it's better to do it in the final week. But some people, when they get it out of the way, they feel much better. Some people like a kind of drip, drip effect throughout the summer where they are doing a little bit every week. Don't take it on holiday with you, though. If you're going on holiday, don't take it on holiday with you. Don't check your emails. Just be really rigid about that. Like if that's holiday time, make it holiday time. Um, but apart from that, you know, know what works for you and you might get it wrong you know you might be experimenting this summer and get it wrong and that's okay that's not a failure you know just learn from it um but be intentional so I set kind of intentions for my days and my weeks so that I used to get caught in this my many of my friends are watching this so I think it's hilarious because I did I got caught in the six weeks regret procrastination cycle of what should I do today oh I don't know oh, I'm going to do nothing and just worry about it oh I've done nothing and now I feel really bad about myself so I just set an intention for the day. What is my intention for the day? Cool, I'm going to relax. Great. So then I can't feel bad about it. That's my intention. What's my intention for the next day? I'm going to get some work done. That doesn't mean I'm going to spend all day doing some work. I'm going to get some work done. So that's my intention. So it might be an intention for half a day, if that's easy. It might be an intention for an hour. But just what is your intention? What do you need to do? And I wish there was a magic wand but it's just about knowing yourself, your preferences, your stresses, your triggers, and trying to work around those things. The, it's, it's uh, I mean, I think that's one of those remarks that can seem a bit innocuous, you know, know yourself, sure, whatever. But it's it's also so deeply profound. I A colleague of mine laughed at me very kindly um, but I was away at half term and I, I had had a very busy run up to half term and I was going to come back and straight into quite an intense period. And so and I'd been away and I was returning on the Saturday before the Monday and I had my computer with me and I sat onto the sat onto the plane with my kids, uh, said to my partner, good luck with the boys. And I worked for X hours on the plane um, and got a head start on what was coming in for Monday. There are times in the year where I would find that horrific, like why on earth would I finish a holiday in that way? What a dreadful thing to do. But the particular set of circumstances I was in and my own knowledge that I was too tired at the beginning of the holiday to do it. And if I didn't look at anything until Monday morning, I would have been in a state of heightened anxiety on Sunday. I knew that using a flight 
to get ahead of the curve on some of this stuff was actually the best use of my time um, because I could come back to being present with my family for the remainder of the weekend after we got back to London. Um, and I think that's that part about knowing about yourself. There is no right answer, is there? We've got to just try and learn from the times that we get it wrong, great opportunities to learn always, the times that we get it right, what have I done here? What will I do again? And learning to build that reflection in, I think, is, is hugely important. And um, I want to pick up Mo's question in here, and I can see that both Sarah and Nick, you've you've had some comments to add about um, the change in job. And I'm going to ask you to come back to that. And then maybe, Amy, um, I, I feel self-consciously as a lady of a certain age, I, I may have to comment on the menopausal point. Um, but there is definitely something to talk about in terms of Mo's question around uh, confidence um, and being menopausal and, and how we think about that. But but Nick and Sarah, to, to the points around the, the subject leadership and taking on a new role and how you approach that and how, how do you get the right run up in the summer to the new academic year? Do you want to say a little bit and expand a bit on what you said in the chat there, either of you? Yeah, I can. Um, I think we both said similar things. Um, although we both work in different um schools, so it's quite good to see kind of the different perspectives because um I work in a primary school and it's very much I find the ownership is on the subject leader to make sure that you kind of have everything in place. So for example, we're imminently expecting offset um uh quite literally any point um and so for example early reading will get a deep dive in um and it's literally on the the early reading lead to be able to present everything if you're the geography lead you are expected to present everything whereas if you were in secondary um it might be that you can delegate some of those tasks to people which is quite interesting and um Nick please correct me if I'm wrong but it sounds like there's the opportunities for you to kind of delegate and be supported a bit more by other people in your team and I guess that might be because you've got a slightly bigger department or because there's more of you as a teacher and a team working together to deliver lessons across the board whereas as a subject leader in a primary school you are on your own effectively um and what I found when I was taking over as a phase leader which in early years is basically a subject and a phase at the same time um because you're a subject and a phase um is to basically kind of have a good understanding of your subject and then to kind of know what's there in place ready for September try and switch off as much as you can maybe spend a bit of time doing some reading about your subject look at the curriculum that's in place for it look at kind of what you've already got the knowledge of in school um and then in September hit the ground running because a subject leadership role is great but it is additional on top of what you're already doing as a class teacher and it is so it can be a lot more work and it's not always sometimes it's great um but if you're having to mark, if you're having to check curriculum, if you're having to manage schemes of work, it can be a lot more. Um, and especially if it's a more core subject that's a lot more assessment heavy, it can have that added impact. Um, so, Nick, you could probably add a bit more, especially around the secondary element of it. Um, yeah, but that's kind of my thoughts on it being in primary. Thank you, Sarah. Nick, to you. Yeah, yeah, I thought. I nailed it. Now, uh, I'm going to dodge the metaphorical pitchforks, um, but uh, Ofsted uh, did something interesting a couple of years ago uh, where they started talking about a lot more about curriculum intent, which is a scary word, um, but actually it's quite an interesting one because it, just like safeguarding, it puts the emphasis on kind of everyone having an idea of why things are done in a certain way. Um, so when I reflect back on my early years teaching as an ECT at Working QT and, then, and so on, I sort of just taught lessons. I didn't really think about why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and I found that actually, because there's now a bit more of a expectation that staff have that holistic idea of what's going on and why is X being done then, then actually staff are seeing it as, I'm not going to say worth their time, but it's actually a benefit to them to understand a bigger picture. Um, so to give you an example in a practical element in a secondary school, although the overall kind of scheme of work, so what we do at what time, how we assess at what time is generally done by me, um, staff 
will be given a responsibility for a particular unit of work or a particular set of resources to generate. And I appreciate not all this is applicable. So apologies, Sarah, if um, if I'm chatting absolute rubbish here for you. But um, you're, you, A, you're giving, I'm going business theory here. A, you're giving people that sense of ownership. B, you're giving them that sense of responsibility. Uh, but more importantly for them, they, they feel like they they understand the overall system better. And I think there's nothing worse for a teacher than being asked a question by a student you don't really have an answer to because fundamentally we we pride ourselves in being the fonts of all knowledge sometimes and it's a bit embarrassing. But I think giving staff that power, that 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 feeling of understanding, that feeling of ownership can be really important. Brilliant. I hope that made sense. Absolutely did. Um, Amy, I'm going to come to you on on the question on me being menopausal and confidence and how that affects us at these points in the year and, and affects us as we both step into a holiday and anticipate stepping back into work at the other end of the holiday. Any mm. thoughts from you on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a menopause expert, but I still think there's things I can probably say on this. And the first one that strikes me is you're not on your own like there is there will be so many staff in school that are going through the same thing and it's a really good opportunity to speak to management about the possibility of a menopause policy because I know that these are becoming more commonplace as they should be there are a lot of women working in education and you know it's a very high pressure job and you know speak to your union if you're not feeling confident to do that it, it's for the good of everyone so don't be afraid to, to bring it up in school. Um, also, you know, summers are great. So it's so difficult to get a GP appointment, but actually we've got time in the summer. So I would say if you're struggling, have a chat to your GP. If your GP doesn't seem that supportive, ask to speak to another GP and say how it's affecting your life because there are things that they can do um, to help. And, you know, in terms of confidence, I think just having a lot of self-compassion for the fact this is a huge transition and you know it's not a small thing you know it affects people so much everyone's different it affects everyone differently but um speaking about it you know finding a network of people that you can talk to maybe it's friends maybe it's a counsellor maybe it's bringing education support um not bottling it all up i think is really important there's such a pressure i think for people to just cope you know what i mean to just cope with this huge massive emotional and physical life transition um and actually there shouldn't be a pressure to just follow it up you should you should be able to speak to someone about it and if you can't then reach out to someone who can who's willing to talk to you about it i think it's really helpful i mean i think that point about not being on your own is so important it's a bit like taking a driving test or or having babies like gazillions of people have done them before and come through the other side but when you're doing it you do feel like you're the only person in the world who's ever been in that hot seat um I think don't be afraid Amy's right there are menopause policies there's template menopause policies that, that the trade unions have um don't be afraid to talk to your line manager about symptoms that are getting in the way of your work you can ask for a reasonable adjustment you can ask for support if the symptoms of menopause are uh, getting in your way in terms of the job you do, if you need to take time during the day to step out of the classroom to attend to whatever's going on for you, then, then your school should be helping you to make that happen, uh, even though that's not straightforward. Uh, for most people, acute menopausal symptoms are sh relatively, sh relatively short-lived in the sense that it's, it's a time-limited temporal phase. Um, uh, throughout all of that, I think the other thing to hold in mind is that hydration, nutrition and exercise, um, tedious though that sounds, uh, are yet again, my kids say, are they the answers to everything, mommy? Yes, they are, including uh, having some positive effect on some menopausal symptoms. So trying to support yourself, actually, and make sure that you're equipping yourself when you go back in the best way possible. I think also to the point about uh, it you know not being on your own there is an increasing amount of, of attention uh, across the media uh, that, that's demystifying and making it more normal to speak about menopause whether it's today's times you've got Emma Bunton talking about uh, the impact menopause had on her libido as a big article on the front of the times 
Um, you've also got Bridget Christie making a comedy show for Channel 4 uh, called The Change. And I believe she gets on a motorcycle and drives around and that's how she deals with um, her early 50s. So, you know, there's lots of stuff out there. You don't need to sit with this and you don't need to, to uh, be afraid about discussing it. I think that's probably the main message there. Um, I want to come to two more topics quickly before we finish up. And I know we will finish up. One is on de-stressing and Sarah and Nick I'm interested in what you each do uh Nick I'm going to come to you first and then I'm going to turn after that to Amy and ask her to just talk to us about burnout uh how we might recognize it what we might need to do if we sense we might be anywhere on that path but Nick if you would first talk to me about how you de-stress and then Sarah I'm going to ask you the same question yep so uh day to day uh the physicality of not having anything at home Specifically at the start of the summer, um, I think that one or two day transition of doing something fun is really important, uh, transforming yourself into holiday mode. Uh, number two, um, which a few people mentioned in the chat earlier about it, um, emails. Um, I have my email on my phone. I don't have any notifications turned on at all. Um, I think going back to what Amy said about um, phones and the, the, the horror they play with our lives, I think having that not, not being oh, I've got something, I'll have a look at it, it's quite important. Um, I actually have my personal outlook turned on, but the fact I have to flick to something almost makes it seem too much effort to bother to do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, I apologise slightly, um, thinking about Sinead and, and water and exercise, but the overwhelming thing that came back from every single member of staff was the absolute simple, simple thing. It was getting outside, it was exercise, and it was doing things you like. And I think you know, there'll be different things for different people. For some people, the idea of going and going to the gym is the worst thing in the world. Go for a walk, go to a park, go to the beach. Do something that forces you to do something for the sole benefit of yourself. And don't be afraid of that coming across selfish. It's okay to look after yourself or to look after your family. And I think generally we we as a profession have an issue of almost feeling guilty 24-7. It's about just saying, actually, I want to do this. I'm going to enjoy it, no matter what that is. Uh, um, my, my colleague will kill me for saying, but for him, it's gaming. He loves nothing better than firing up his old N64, playing some old games and sitting around by himself watching Netflix. And that's fine. And there's no need to feel that way. We don't judge him. We don't judge him at all. Everybody is welcome here, Nick, um, uh, including the gamers. So, so that's lovely to hear the range of things. Because actually, you're right. It's not it's not jogging around the park for everybody. There's we all have different different things that help us to to make that shift. Um, uh, Sarah, talk to us about de-stressing for you. Um, yeah. So day to day, kind of after work, I try and go to the gym or just walk, um, walk around the block. Um, and then in the holidays similar to Nick really just try and plan different things out that I know I'm going to enjoy meeting up with friends um trying to switch off often I end up meeting up with teacher friends um and we have a good old chinwag about work um which is stressful but it's also a really good de-stress because nine times out of ten we have the same kind of um pet peeves about things that have gone on so it's a nice way to de-stress um especially over a few um teas and coffees um and other bits as well but again going to the gym just getting out for a walk even if it's just to the coffee shop at the road and up the road and back um and things like seeing family or friends which I know for some people can be quite a lot um but like Nick said even just doing like one little thing for yourself a day is so so important um and it isn't selfish at all and it took me a long time to kind of get to that point where I was okay with doing things for myself and not constantly doing things for other people um, and recognising that actually, you know, self-care isn't selfish. Just because of the self in there doesn't mean to say that, you know, it is for, for you and it is selfish. Actually, it's imperative. It's part of our body. It's it's innate in us and we need to take that time for ourselves. So definitely, definitely, you know, make that time and find things you enjoy um you know I go to the gym I don't necessarily enjoy it but I enjoy swimming so I'll kind of go to the gym do something I don't really like and then enjoy what I do like lovely stuff and, and I think to your point about pet peeves I think it's underrated 
the value of ranting with friends, it can be very cathartic if you're doing it with people who understand and you've got a shared experience and you have something light around it. I think we we um, we all know that sometimes we can get sucked into a bit of a dark place. But as long as we're keeping it in that mode of we're self-consciously aware of what we're doing and how we're using this rant. And then we move on and have a giggle or whatever it is that we do. Uh, I think it's really it can be really quite, quite valuable. And I think there's, there's actually some good evidence that it's quite valuable for us. Um, Amy. Burnout, it's it's often discussed. Uh, is it overused? What does it actually mean? And should I be worried about it? I think it's underused by teachers and education staff. To be honest, burnout is a spectrum and we tend to not realise we're in burnout until we are really burnt out and we are signed off sick or we are, uh, in my case, when I burnt out, you know, I was still doing well at work, but my personal life was a mess you know, because I just never said no, my boundaries were atrocious, I was doing everything for the good of the children, and I never put any boundaries in, I had to learn the hard way, um, so you know, what you're looking for, and, and think of it as a spectrum, don't wait until you get into that red zone, you know, is, are you beginning to find that you're losing the joy and think, can, are you feeling numb, you know, are you tired all of the time, I'm tired all the time anyway, but are you more tired than you normally are, um, is there a sense of hopelessness, impending doom, dread all of the time? Um, are you feeling more anxious than normal? Are you feeling more depressed than normal? Are you in a state of freeze? And um, do things have to be perfect or are you procrastinating a lot? And I'm guessing a lot of people are probably thinking this is quite common working in education. Um, and sadly, you know, until we've got system change, there's not a lot we can do about the system we're working in, but we can start putting proactive strategies in place before we get to that red zone of burnout where we are really ill so you know things like what brings you comfort there's a great book um, called lost connections by johan hari and it's a study on anxiety and depression and how actually a lot of the time it's that we aren't making time for connections with others connections with ourselves connection with nature connection with what we feel our purpose is hobbies things like that when we put those connections in place actually we're a lot less likely to burn out um, so much I could say about burnout and where we've, we've not got a huge amount of time but I think seeing it's a spectrum being really really compassionate to yourself not waiting I, I have a saying that burnout is not a badge of honor because so often in education we don't even realize we're doing it but like, oh I marked till midnight last night or, or colleagues that come in and they're like oh I'm so ill but I'm still here and it's like why you know you need to stop <laughs> and you need to make sure that you're looking after yourself it's so 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 important and you know I, I relate to that feeling of I can't stop because it's for the children I'm a counsellor now I do suicide risk assessments as part of my job and my supervisor if she heard that I wasn't taking time for myself that I wasn't scheduling breaks that I wasn't putting these things in place would tell me I wasn't fit to practice she would be absolutely furious so it's not the responsibility that is keeping us from taking the time it's the pressure that others put on us and we put on ourselves but if we stop it will be okay the world won't explode so it's taking that pressure off ourselves we are not solely responsible for everything we can't be that's a very eloquent um uh explanation there amy and i, I think the other thing that i've learned through the work that we do here is people often are will often say, I don't have time to attend to whatever these symptoms are that's going on. And I think one thing we've learned is it takes a lot more time to recover from a breakdown mm -hmm. or from burnout than it does to make a pause and try and deal with things in real time. We struggle to hold that perspective, but it's definitely a lot more efficient from a time perspective to pause and stop and deal with things when you start to feel like you're not okay. And to that end, anyone who thinks that, that, that who has any concern for themselves and they go, oh God, is that me? Um, our 08,562561 number is 24 seven available uh, to anyone who wants to have a conversation. We've got, we've got qualified counselors on the other end of the phone. They specialize in the education profession. So reach out and have a conversation. And that's a great first step. You know, hearing yourself speak out loud to somebody who's qualified to help you have a conversation is a great first step. So if, if that's you, please use that. And um, I'm going to ask you all, please, as we wind up for one tip, your top tip. And this is where usually you steal each other's tips, I think. So whoever gets in first is going to be first off the, you know, they get in with the best one. But 
one top tip that you would give your younger self heading into uh, a, a summer break from school? What have you got? I'll go first. <laughs> um, so mine, I was thinking about this on the tube um, right into work today. Um, and mine was when we think we're resting, we're actually not resting. Um, and so to really just rest, like switch off, lie in your dark room and do nothing. And that is OK. Um, and that took me a long time to get my head around and realize. And it took me to get to burn out to realize that. Um, but, at, you know, it's it's worth it and it is useful and you can do it. And you don't need to beat yourself up about it. It's not a bad thing. Um, but it's so, so good to do um and kind of the refresh that you feel from it is worth it so that's kind of my top tip don't oh. feel bad for for rest thank you sarah amy i am going to expand on what sarah said which is i absolutely agree with um i would say look up the seven types of breast we've not really had time to look into it today but it's fascinating that there's we often think we're resting but we're only doing one thing um so there's physical mental sensory emotional social and creative and if we can get a little bit of a balance then that helps us feel a lot better and I hate to say it because I absolutely hate exercise hate exercise but moving it does make such a difference it's all about your autonomic nervous system I hate it my dog thinks I'm mad because I do the squats in the kitchen to just get some exercise in because you will never find me at a gym but I feel so much better so don't just try and think your way out of it if you're feeling stressed get moving as well I hate that I've just said that but it's true Brilliant. Love it. Nick, what have you got? Well, Gareth stole mine about being a parent, sibling, grandparent first, but uh, no, no, it's quite an easy one, actually. Um, I actually said to a student earlier, um, don't try and be perfect. Um, at the end of the day, you you are not going to be a perfect teacher, a perfect parent, a perfect friend, a perfect brother, a perfect sister. You have to draw the line somewhere. If at any time your job ever risks any of those important things in your life, it's a job. You know, it's, it's a very sad thing. It's an old school business term, but if you die, your school or job will replace you. Your parents won't, your friends won't, your siblings won't, your children won't. Thank you, Nick. A bit depressing, sorry. <laughs> oh, that brings us back to a, a, a great piece of perspective. Um, I'm going to throw mine in, which is you are entitled to a holiday. Please take it. Turn off all the stuff. You know, if there's a crisis and an emergency, somebody will find you, right? But whatever period of time you decide you're really off, off, be off, off, like going out, out, be off, off. I'm trying to try to make that a thing, but I don't, nobody's picking it up. So I'm just going to swallow that. And um, there is a survey link in the chat. Please use it because we can make these events better when you tell us what you think. And um, there are some beautiful pieces of wisdom in the chat with people sharing their top tip that they'd give themselves. Um, and uh, there's somebody who is going to do something different as a result of this webinar, which I personally take as um, uh, rock and roll. That's that's like one of the best things that's happened all week. Um, I want to thank this wonderful panel for their fantastic and generous uh, and thoughtfulness, uh, their, their thoughtful contributions, really um, superb and, and focused on trying to give everybody as much as 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 possible in 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 ideas and things to do and um, you all uh working in schools across the country you're marvelous we think you are the bee's knees we wish you an absolutely wonderful summer when you get to it uh and we will see you for you know we'll see you for the autumn but that's miles away go and chill out my friends have a great one thank you all for attending today thank you panel travel well